I want us to talk about receiving our blessings in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are all Christians and we know that when we are born again, we are put into the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And in the body of Christ, definitely there are many blessings that we can get. When you read the word of God, you see that there are so many things that we have been promised. And one of the very famous verses you know is Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. I think most people know it, so we don't even have to open it. Like when you say Matthew 7, 7, right? It says, ask and it shall be given unto you, right? Mm-hmm. That's the word of God itself. It says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Mm-hmm. So in Christ Jesus, it means that when you, you go before the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and you ask for something, you should receive it, mm-hmm. right? If you, if you go down, you realize that it was really talking about the, the blessings you get on this earth. Because as Christians, when it comes to our, our spiritual salvation, then we don't have to ask for it. It is, it is already guaranteed. But this one I was talking about the blessings we are supposed to receive in this world. And it talked about the fact that even human fathers, like mortal fathers, are even able to love their children so that they can give them good gifts. So how much more our Father in heaven? That's what Jesus Christ was saying. So he was talking about this earth, what we can get whilst we're on this earth. He's not talking about asking for salvation because that one is already sealed. It is already finished. So he's talking about things on this earth, right? But I think it's also important that we also understand the nature of God in giving so that we will not misuse this quote and we will not think that sometimes God is not answering us when we ask. We have to really understand, like... How does God give to his children? If you, if you study the people of Israel, I usually like using Israel to, um, as, as a point of study for us as Christians because it's a, continu- it's a continuation of God's work with Abraham. If you read in the book of Romans, Romans 4 from 13 to 17, the whole story is there that the promise that was made to Abraham is not just to the the descendants by his blood, right? Not the descendants by love, but to all of us who have the same faith as Abraham. Mm-hmm. So it's, we are a continuation of God's work with Abraham. Mm-hmm. So when we look at how God dealt with Israel, we can understand how he's also going to deal with us and how he's dealing with us, how he deals with his children, mm-hmm. because he really doesn't change. Okay, so God had promised Abraham first, then later the promise went to his son Isaac, then from Isaac to Jacob, then so many things happened through Joseph and everything. By the time you got to the book of Exodus, you realized that the Israelites were now in another man's country. They were in a different land and they were slaves in a different land and they were suffering. And the interesting thing was that it was at a time when they had a promised land somewhere waiting for them. But they were in a different land and they were suffering. They were groaning, they were having a lot of difficulty. And because of this suffering that they are having, the, the word of God says that God remembered them. It's not like God forgot, but it's like God realized that this is the time for him to act. He decided that this is the time he's going to act upon his promise. So they, they are really suffering. Okay, now, just imagine God sent someone to come for the children of Israel. And when he brought them, when he brought Moses to come and take them, like from the bondage that they were in. Mm-hmm. He came with so many wonders, he came with so many punishments on the gods of Egypt to come and take his children, Israel, to the promised land. Now, the interesting part of the story, which I want us to look at, is, is about to come, right? That's the part I really want us to pay attention to. For us to see how God gives to his children. Mm-hmm. Like when God promises something, how does he give to his children? So the Israelites have gone through the desert, they have gone through so many lessons, the things that were happening in the desert, like God was always with them, he, he was always them, with them physically, you could see the cloud, you could see the cloud of fire by day and also by night, so they actually felt the presence of God. Now they have reached the land that God has promised to them, it is their land, right? So you expect that well, we have come to the land that belongs to us, God owns everything and he said this thing I promised to you people, so it's yours. You expect that God will give them this land, like they just walk into it and they'll get it, right? Now, this is the same God who destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from heaven. 
So you, you can know that God can just send fire. The same he sent the, the fire onto the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to clear out the land of Canaan. And apart from that, to, as, um, as God was sending his plagues onto the land of Egypt, he also, in the last prayer, the tenth prayer, he, he took the lives of the firstborn of every household in Egypt. And he says that it was even in the houses of their slaves and among the animals even. Right? The Israelites didn't have to do anything. So you understand that God could have also taken the lives of the people in the land of Canaan. Then all that God will say, God will say, go and gather their bodies and burn it like rubbish. Right? Mm -hmm. But here's an interesting thing. When they got to the time for them to enter the land, God said they have to fight to take the land. Mm -hmm. It was something that was very, very interesting. It was unbelievable to me. And even with us as Christians, we sometimes experience the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. You just imagine that you are these Israelites. Sometimes we pray to God, we ask for God for something, and we expect that God probably is going to send it by DHL, you be on your bed, mm -hmm. you come and knock, you said, this God's answer, like, there's an answer to your prayer. Mm -hmm. So you just go for it, be on your bed. But one very interesting thing Timothy has been saying on this particular point with his life, he said, you see, there was a time he was looking for work. And he had been praying, he had been looking for it. Then there was this brother James. I don't know how many of you know James. Like, not the James you know we have now, but James is gone. He finished about two years ago, two years ago, right? two or three years ago, right? He did his master's. When he came to Samara, I think he was in his first year of master's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was already in his first year of master's. And one day, brother James told Timothy, he told him that, well, you're always praying for work. But then after you finish praying, you don't come and sit on the nest to search for the work. So you'll be praying, but you're not searching how you go to get the work. So in the end, Brother Timothy added work to his faith, right? And then in the end, he started searching, and in addition to the prayer, the work became too much. That's the testimony today I've been hearing, that he's saying now the work is so much, he doesn't know where to put people. Right? Now, the people of Egypt, they are seeing, the, the people of Israel, they are seeing how God took them out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it means that if their faith in him has already been established, they should believe that every single battle they're going to fight in the land of Canaan will end in a victory, right? Mm -hmm. So it means that from the faith that we build, God is going to test the faith for us to prove. We are supposed to prove that we have faith in him by the work they are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And God really expects us, that just like um, it's written in the book of James, James chapter 2 verse 17, right? It says, faith without works is dead. You can check it for yourself like later. For the thing to go fast, I think I'll be seeing most of it. So you can check, cross check to make sure that what I'm seeing is really reaching the word of God. Okay. Now, just by the way, as Israel was entering, crossing over, like to when take the land, mm. the first city that they brought down, the first one that they captured was the city of Jericho. Mm -hmm. Now, when they went to the city of Jericho, God had already told them how they were supposed to take it. God was the one going to bring down the walls of the city of Jericho. And God, God, like he had the means, and of course he had already done so much, they had seen him do so much already, so they knew it was nothing for him. So God told them that he just marched around the wall, around the wall seven times, and I'm going to bring down the walls for you. Right? But all the same, the Israelites had to take an army of 40,000 people, 40,000 men to go and take the land. Right? Even though God was going to bring down the walls. Now, just think of it like this. Like, God, when God wants to do something for you, He can give you favor, He can give you an advantage, mm -hmm. but then you still have to finish the fight. You have to do something. Mm -hmm. It's something that's very important for us to understand as Christians because sometimes we're asking from God and we fold our arms and we sit down and we want God to do everything mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. But then He plays the faith in you that He has to test, mm -hmm. right? We we'll look at all this and we we'll understand why God wants to test our faith mm -hmm. because it's very, very important that we understand. Yeah, that we understand all these things. Okay. Now, God has a lot of importance that he attaches to the battle that we fight as Christians, right? Now, this battle that the Israelites are going to fight, it was not expected to be a one-time thing. If you think that it was just for them to get the land, then you are wrong. It was not just for them to get the promised land. They are about to read it. This one, I'd like you to read it yourself because if I say it, you may have it, find it difficult like believing that it's within the word of God, you'll be surprised that mm -hmm. God says something like this. Mm -hmm. So I want this one, I want one of you to read it. Mm -hmm. Judges chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Judges chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. 
Judges chapter 3, yeah. verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had, known, who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Yeah, this one is unbelievable, right? God specially left some, some nations in the land of Canaan to trouble the Israelites. God said that even that the, the next generations, they're not fighting to, to claim peace for the next generation. God said he, he wanted to leave some of the nations in the land of Canaan so that the generations after them will also experience war. So it means that God had a very, very important reason why he wanted his children to know battle. He, test is written there, right? Test. Yeah, test. Like, God wanted them to know war. So, yeah, that first battle that they're fighting, it wasn't just for them to gain their peace, then they come and relax. God wanted every single generation, he wanted his children to know war. And it was true, he fulfilled this word. In, in, in Jerusalem, there, there was this Jebus side, they were always there. There are some other tribes, you see the Philistines, or the, like different parts of the land. If you read certain parts of the Bible, you see the different tribes that were the, left in the land of Israel. Throughout, always, there were other tribes that were left there. Even you saw the deal they did with the Gibeonites, they left them to be in, but that one came a bit through deception. But I think that God specifically left them there because he wanted to test them. You see? Now, we as Christians, we are not expected to be fighting these real physical battles. The things have changed. Only one thing has changed. Like, only the kind of warfare has changed. But it doesn't mean that we as Christians, we are free. It doesn't mean we are free from warfare, where things are just going to be rosy for you, where your life is, because they say land of um, um, milk and honey, so your life as a Christian is just supposed to be so, so free and so sweet for you, right? We as Christians, our warfare is just a bit different. That's in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. That one I think we can read together. But it says that for the, the weapons of our warfare are not canal, right? It just means that the, the weapons that we use as Christians are not physical. But we still, have, we still have a war because it says warfare. So we as Christians, we also have certain tests that are supposed to be, to be coming our way, certain battles. And they are means to test our faith. They are very, very important to God. God places a very huge importance to it. So what I was thinking is, if God places a huge importance on it, we have to understand why he places this importance on it so that it's going to uh, guide us to, to help us create and have the right attitude when we are going through this warfare, this spiritual warfare. Now, if you read um, James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, you realize that it is very similar like to this Judges 3 verse 1 and 2, in a way, because for us Christians, God also expects, expects us to go through certain tests, and just like the Israelites had to go through the, the battle, they their own was physical, but our own is spiritual, right? So if you read James chapter 1 verse 2 to 4, which is a very good, a very, very good Bible passage. Patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Okay. So for us, right, these trials, these small, small trials that you have been praying about and God hasn't yet answered, as you think, you think God hasn't yet answered, right? It is supposed to work, do a certain work in us. He says that when a trial comes away, you can't enjoy it because it's going to produce what patience in you. Then in the end, he said it's going to make you complete. I don't know the word they use in your Bible. Complete. Yeah, complete. That completion eh, is talking about maturity. So it means that those trials that you are, you are experiencing, those things, those rough parts in your path, those rough, um, like those rough periods in your life, is supposed to bring you to maturity in Christ. Christ expects us to be matured. And that completion, it means that you have reached this stage where things, certain things don't bother you. You have seen everything. You know, you know how it's going to end. Because you know God. God has already taught you that you can trust in Him. He has won many battles with you. But... You just imagine that God is just carrying you like an egg, and you never see his wonder. He never does anything for you to, to see how, how powerful God is. If you are going to preach to someone about God, and you don't have anything to tell the person about his difficulties in life, you can't tell him any, anything about how God has pulled you out of a pit, how God has done great things for you, 
what kind of what kind of God are you going to present to the person to the, for the person to understand that this is a place that can come and get redemption? Mm-hmm. So God has a purpose for the trials in our lives. He said for completion, that was maturity. It also means God doesn't expect us to remain as babies. We're always we, like we always have to be carried around and be pampered. We always have to we have to be prepared that the hard things are going to come to us. The maturity. When you read about it, he's talking about things like uh, like small small things like. Um, being able to un- understand that uh, sometimes things are going to hurt you, the world is not going to always be friendly, and maturity about the word of God, maturity about how to treat brothers, how to sometimes be able to put others ahead of you, put the interests of other people ahead of you. So many things enter this maturity. And on this one, it's a whole different topic too on this one. Yeah, but when the trial comes, you should understand that God is trying to work something in you. Don't lose faith. So if I'm going to fight a battle, you should always be able to have certain like equipment for yourself. You don't expect that you just go and fight and you don't have anything. So God provided us with with um, with battle battle gear, as they call it. So God provided us with battle gear. He didn't leave us defenseless. Um, I want us to study very well the kind of equipment that God has given to us. I know definitely we have seen some parts of it already, but let's read it again and look at the equipment one by one. Ephesians 6, verse 11 to 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 17. So, yeah, so we will not just experience the warfare, but God has provided us with battle gear. But this thing is such that it, it will not just come automatic. These are things that we have to work for, things that we should strive to hold. God is not, the, is not going to be the one to come and Fight it for you. He has equipped you. So take the equipment and wear it. If you wear it, that's when you'll be able to go through the trials. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 17. Okay, down to let's read. Let's read. Who is reading that one? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 to 17. Okay, put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor. Mm-hmm. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yes. But against principalities, mm-hmm. against powers, mm-hmm. against the rulers of darkness of this world, mm-hmm. against spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm-hmm. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, mm-hmm. that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, mm-hmm. and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins prepared about the truth, truth? and having mm-hmm on the breastplate of righteousness mm-hmm. and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace mm-hmm. above all taking the shield of faith mm-hmm. wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked mm-hmm. and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god yeah this is amazing it mentioned we, 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 rest, we rest not against flesh and blood. Just like, just like we have already understood. I want you to know a physical one. But against spiritual wickedness in high places. Rulers and dark, of darkness of this world and, you know, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So, last time I was, I heard uh, the late Dr. Moss, Monroe, because he also talked about these principalities. And he was explaining that the main principles, right? So, the fact that I say spiritual wickedness, it doesn't mean that you should just expect that the battle is just spiritual. So when um, when you are you are working like um, among like among your friends or when you go out, you don't pay attention to things around you. So that's what it means. You pay attention to every single thing people say. These principles, things that people are pushing to you and all that, they are all part of it. Now, when it comes to truth, the belt of truth, the truth is the word of God. So we need the word of God, right? The truth. Only the word of God defines truth. Truth is not plural, so you, you don't expect that just anything that someone says is you can you can just consider that truth because a majority of people say it's true. Truth is referring to what God says is true. So number one, you must understand the word of God. You must obey it. You must you must live by it. It also mentioned righteousness. Righteousness is also from your effort. That as in, it also comes from you. That what I'm saying. It comes from you. Even though just by what you do, you cannot get 100% righteousness. God has already topped it up for you with the grace. So you, you can only have 100% in that area. Just trust in Him. Yeah. But apart from these other things that are defending you, He said the faith is your shield, right? 
for the defense. But apart from all these things that are defending, you're also expected to use the sword of the word, right? To also do something. As in, you must, you must study the word of God so that you have this sword in your hand. It's a sword that's what you should cast the way. You should cast things to, like, to make your progress, right? So the sword is also very important. And the word of God de describes the word of God in the word, right? It described as a double-edged sword, which is very powerful. Like the Romans, the Roman army, it was a very, very strong army. Because their swords were double-edged, it means it cuts on both sides. When you cut, when you, you plunge it in and you are pulling it out, it cuts going in and coming out. So that's a double-edged sword. The word of God is very powerful, and that's what you are supposed to use for our offensive. You are not expected to just defend, defend, but you are also supposed to, to, to break down to break down obstacles, to bring, break, bring down these principalities by the word of God. Yeah, so this is the equipment. I like, like to encourage all of us to study this equipment, to understand like, where you lack in any of these areas, so that you strengthen yourself in that area. So when these trials that will come, certainly from the word of God, right? It will certainly come, so you should prepare yourself with this equipment. Okay, now we are past that point. Now there's another very interesting thing I wanted to talk about. Now, before the children of Israel went to Canaan to go and take the land, when Moses came to them to come and tell them about God who wanted to take them out of bondage, and they heard about this land flowing in milk and honey. At the moment that they set off, the land that they were going to, to stay in, the land that they were going to claim as their inheritance, it was already occupied. Mm -hmm. I want you to take serious like meditation, like just think about this particular point. The land they were going to occupy when God came for them was already occupied when they were going to it. It's very important that you think about it to understand. Now, we sit down, we look into the future. You are praying to God for something. And the place you try to see yourself, no one has ever passed through that thing before. People are telling you that this place, that place is choked. Just forget about it. Or people are telling you that no one has ever tried this thing before. But the, the fact is that, just like this land was occupied before they went, God is just waiting for it to be ready. When you get there, God will clear them out. So I want you to understand that as a Christian, when you reach a, a situation that it seems choked, it seems choked, it seems impossible to pass through. Just remember this particular thing. That at the time that they set off to go and clean the land, it was occupied. I also want to use an example that is also involved in the same brother James that um, I already mentioned in Timothy's story. When, when I came to Samara, like, I've, I've always loved aviation. I loved aviation so much. And I've always wanted to end up in, uh, like in, in in maintenance and servicing and all that. So I really loved aviation all my life. But when I came here, because of the language problem, I chose the wrong faculty. Like, not wrong as in the faculty is wrong, but like for me, it wasn't what I wanted. You see, for some people, it's, it's theirs. Everyone has his, his, um, his particular choosing place. But where the place I've been dreaming of all my life, it was the, the faculty of the maintenance and servicing and all that. When I came and there had been a confusion, it was something that really affected me. and. It was possible I may not even have studied. I, I don't know if I've told some before, but I, it was possible I may not have even studied. I would have had it very difficult. I mean, I even had to go back because my, my heart was not in that other place they put me. Okay, now, it came to trying to change the faculty. And because there had not been any example of someone who had changed faculty before, people were like, oh, this thing I'm trying to do. Someone even told me, said, this thing I'm trying to do, you are wasting your time. Just continue. And very discouraging words, people were talking like that, someone was telling me, oh man, this thing, I'm just going to pay so much money, then this thing can happen for you, I don't know, I didn't have that kind of money. So it was like, a situation that was not supposed to be possible. But thank God that Brother James was there, and he was like, he said, no, pursue this thing, even if you go and the man, the decan is giving you trouble like this to other people, I'll come and be with you and I'll help you out. I was, I was so, so helped by this thing he said. And by God's grace, Unbelievably, in a very short time, for the first time, it just happened just like that, and the faculty was changed. So he just told me, it's it just something that has lived on in my life, that what if that trial, like I had just given up, would I, would I have ever gotten to the end to see what God can do, right? So the trials will come, they will come, but you have to persevere. I had to go so many times, people, had to, people said very discouraging things to me. But thank God that God, like Brother Flora said, pray that God will give you people around you to help you, to show you up when you are down. 
Brother James was there, I really thank God for his life. I told him that any place he goes to say that, any place he goes to and people ask him what he has done in someone's life, he always mention me, I'll be there, I'll come and testify that yes, he did that thing for me. Amen. Yeah, he really did, it was a big thing, he may not have noticed this day, but it have affected my whole life. This, this is something I really wanted so much, like something I've dreamed of. You see, some people choose their careers when they are children, that it means that they really love it. I chose this thing when I was in junior high school and I worked towards it. I really worked, I, I really made sure I studied for it and God finally brought me and then this thing happened. But by God's grace, I was able to overcome. So that was a situation, as a, a situation where it was expected that nothing was supposed to happen. But then it was because God had not yet brought someone, he had not yet prepared someone to come and change the situation. So whenever you get to such a situation, remember the Israelites, that when they were going to the land of Canaan, it was occupied. So just pray that God is going to give you the perseverance, that you shall change the situation, that the place that is occupied, that place in the future, they said, there's no work there, or they said, there's no space for you, or they said, there's no, that place, just forget it, you can't go and make it there, forget it. When God takes you there, you are ready, it's going to change. The whole situation will change. Hallelujah. Right now, by God's grace, that faculty thing, is, it, it doesn't happen anymore. That's been an example. So now it changes so easily. People didn't know how it was. It was difficult. It used to be difficult. Okay. Now, another thing we got to is that when God fulfills the promise, He fulfills it completely. He's going to do it completely, more than you could ever have dreamed, dreamed about. When He fulfills that blessing for you, He's going to do it completely. So, we should wait upon him. See, let's see the example of the, of the Israelites. We'll look at three, three different verses. One is Joshua chapter 21. Joshua chapter 21, verse 43 to verse 45. Joshua chapter 21, verse 43 to verse 45. To see how God fulfilled the promise to the Israelites. Because if he promised them, right? Let's see how God fulfills. To what extent will God bless you when God says He's going to do something for you? To what extent is He going to do it? Joshua chapter, chapter 21, 21, verse 43 to verse 45. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which He had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave them rest all around, mm -hmm. according to all that He had sworn to their fathers. Mm -hmm. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord mm -hmm. delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. All came to pass. Okay, you say you give them all the land, right? Okay, you say you give them land, so you give them all the land. Okay. But now, it gets better. I want them to see to the extent to which you give them the land, right? They were expecting land, okay? So let's read. Just same Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verse 13. Joshua 24 verse 13. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have given you a land for which you do not labor, and cities which you do not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves, groves which you did not plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, he didn't just give them land. He gave them the cities. He gave them uh, yards and... Um, only what they write there. Vineyards. vineyards. Give them cities, give them vineyards. Again, Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. See the extent. So it wasn't just the land he gave to them. He gave it to them. He, he, he fulfilled the promise properly. Not just the land. Cities, vineyards. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. This is proper real estate. Water source. He gave them goods, the houses were there, the cities were there, vineyards. So God fulfilled the promise like much, much better than they could have ever imagined. He promised them land, but he gave them more than that. That's how much God fulfills his promise to us, his blessings. So in Christ he says, just like the Israelites, they had a promise, right? We, ask, we, ask, we, are, um, we share of this promise of Abraham from, from this, uh, from the, the passage I mentioned about Romans 4, 13 and 17, you can study what to understand, that the promise to Abraham was not just to those who, who descended from him according to the law, but to everyone who by the same faith believes in God, right? So we are in the same, we are in the same position as the Israelites were. 
And see what he's saying. See how God fulfilled the promise to them. He didn't just give them land, but he gave it to them in abundance. So wait upon God. When God is giving to you, he's going to give to you in abundance. In the moment they are waiting for God to fulfill, you don't make the mistake of trying to take a shortcut to make things better for yourself. Yeah, we'll look at the example of a king, king the one king of Judah was called King Asa. What, what he did, thinking that he was trying to save himself, but he was able to do something to get some temporal rest, respite, but he lost the bigger thing. Right? Let's, let's look at the story of King Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 to 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 to 9. Yeah, to see. Second yeah, Chronicles chapter 16, yeah. verse 7. Another time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Where the, where the Ethiopians and the Lubim, not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars. Okay. So the background of the story was Kinasa was under siege. Like, Someone had come to besiege the cities, right? I think Ben had that. So he tried to seek, um, tried to seek salvation and went to make a deal with the king of Syria. And the king of Syria, he came and truly he came to like to come and harass this other king, such that he became free of this trouble that was coming. So he had been able to solve the problem. He had been able to get out of the problem. But then a prophet of God came to him and told him that. If he had relied upon God rather than going to this other king that God had not suggested to him, this other Gentile king, then God would have also given him even this king of Syria in addition to this other man. So then he had caused a bigger problem than he was trying to solve. So he, got, he had a temporal solution, but he lost a bigger, a bigger blessing that God, was, well, that God could have given to him. This Syrian king and their descendants, the later become a, a huge stone in the flesh of the people of Judah. Yeah, so you realize how much you can lose if you try to have a shortcut to like to save ourselves instead of relying upon God. Okay. So in all this the last thing I just want to say to you is that God expects us to grow. And it's only in that period when God is trying to teach us to trust in him that he he, he pampers us. Just like um, the Israelites, when they are now learning who God was, God was pampering them constantly with this pillar of fire. He was giving them manna, He was giving them so much. The word of God says, even their clothes, they didn't become worn out. Their sandals didn't become worn out. Their feet never became swollen. It's all in the word of God. And also, they are having manna to eat. Right? But then, from the moment they stepped onto the promised land, God had already shown them what, what kind of God that He was. So Joshua chapter 5 verse 12 says that the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten of the produce of the land. Because God expected that they should be complete. It's the same way to with us. Like when God has already tested us, he has tested us in many ways to make sure that we become complete and mature in his word. He expects that we stop behaving like children. He stop spoon feeding us. God is going to stop spoon feeding us. He expects us to be able to be mature, to even help other people who are going through their difficulties. So this, this is the word of God. I hope that and it shall grow in you, it shall bear fruit by God's grace. Yeah, in all of you are. May the Lord bless this message. Amen. Amen. Amen.